welcome everyone to the Ontario Caregiver Organization's webinar series. Uh, these webinars bring together caregivers and subject matter experts to explore topics of interest to caregivers. We do this to support and engage chosen family, friends, and neighbors who are caring for someone. My name is Katie Muirhead. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm going to be your host for today. We're doing something a little bit different today in that we are hosting a panel conversation and we have a guest moderator who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. We begin this gathering by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform with people joining us from across the province and in some cases across Canada, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. The land that I'm standing on today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is in, within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And acknowledging this reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendships of Indigenous people. As team members at OCO, we are learning about the lands from which we work and exploring how we can be meaningful allies and how we can support the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. So we invite you to take a moment today to reflect the land on the land where you are. And if you're not familiar with that, that's okay. We'll be sharing an interactive map that tells you which traditional territory your city or town sits on. You can find that at native-land.ca and we will be sharing that in the chat box as well. So our webinar today is called Providing Care to 2SLGBTQ Plus Persons. This webinar will focus on personal and professional patient-centered care for 2S LGBTQ plus individuals. Today, we've got a guest moderator who I'm gonna inter uh, introduce in a moment and a wonderful group of panelists who's going to discuss cultural safety and humility, clinical competencies and interdisciplinary care for cisgender and transgender patients. We'll also explore chosen families, inclusive language, and communications to 2S LGBTQ plus individuals. So I'm so pleased to introduce you to our guest moderator today, Devin Ambiar. He's, he's joining us uh, for this session. Devin has been providing training and education on 2S LGBTQ plus communities and HIV for over 20 years to various communities and clinicians through his consultancy. Devin will be joined by our panelists, Ryan and RN, Shoshana, a senior trans advocate, and Susa, a nurse practitioner. You can review their bios in the invitation for today's session if you'd love to learn more about them. So I just want to welcome all of you today, and I'm going to turn it over to Devin to continue the conversation. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for making the time to come today to listen to our session on amazing panelists. So I've been fortunate to know uh, all our panelists today and I was happy to able to make sure they were available for today's session. Good afternoon, Ryan, Shoshana and Suza. So I would like to start the conversation today by inviting our panelists to speak on their professional and personal experiences on providing care to two as LGBTQ persons or receiving care as a LGBTQ person. After the panelists have spoken, so we'll take around 30 minutes, uh, we will take questions from the audience and audience, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. So today I would like to start with Ryan first, who's going to speak about his experience uh, in terms of providing care. Perfect, thank you everyone. So I just want to say this is uh, so amazing to see so many people attending the session today and wanting to explore and expand your knowledge on this diverse community. I think that's extremely important. First, I also want to say happy pride and thank you again for helping to embrace our differences and celebrate our similarities. So yes, my name is Ryan Wanamaker and I was in the role of the day health program and community registered nurse at Casey House for three years. My pronouns are he, him. I've recently moved on from a full-time position at, at, to an or, external organization 
I am so grateful for the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance and the Ontario Caregivers Organization for allowing me to still talk with you all today. So uh, to start, some of you may not be aware of what Casey House is. So before I get into talking about the forever advancing care of, for people living with HIV, I quickly want to explain. So Casey House is a subacute HIV specific hospital here in Toronto, Ontario. At Casey House, we support people living with HIV who are 18 years and older. We do this through two programs. Our first program is our inpatient program where we have 14 beds, two of which are respite beds for outpatients. Here, we are able to provide clinical support to our community members by providing um, subacute medical needs, palliative needs, and rehabilitative services after admissions to an acute hospital or even from home. Uh, we really provide a unique uh, service as each case is looked at individually and we see how we are able to provide the most client-centered care uh, using a harm reduction model. So we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of an amazing interdisciplinary team, which I'm gonna dive into the importance of in a couple minutes. The second program is our day health program, which I was a part of. When we provide services to our community members through an outpatient approach, and our team is comprised of a handful of talented providers, which includes a nurse practitioner, social work, case manager, recreational therapists, registered massage therapists, registered nurses, a physiotherapist, program assistant, and a psychiatrist. So the, the, it's quite a long list. Uh, our team helps to provide clients clinical, um, direct client clinical care, as well as creating holistic and therapeutic programming. So now that you all know where I'm coming from, uh, today, we're going to be focusing on, I'm going to be helping you guys increase your knowledge slightly on some important elements of HIV care for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. And I'm going to be focusing on comorbidities, our aging HIV population, stigma and confidentiality. So, okay, so let's dive into it. Um, so just a little bit background knowledge, I think that's important. So with the in incredible advancing of modern HIV care, we're seeing people with HIV live longer, which is absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, HIV has an age accelerating process, which puts our clients at risk of increased frailty. So there is a great study that the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange, CATI for short, so that's C-A-T-I-E, um, talked about regarding frailty. And they looked at people living with HIV uh, and people that were not living with HIV and compared frailty levels. And they ensured that they were all kind of um, scoring similarly on the social economic scale and health domains. So the numbers were pretty shocking, but not surprising. And I think it's really good to give some perspective. So they categorized people into three categories, robust, pre-frail, and frail. So in the robust category, we had 61% of HIV negative participants and only 37% of HIV positive. Within the pre-frail, so they're at risk of becoming frail, we had 36% of HIV negative participants and over half, 52% of HIV positive. And then lastly, for the frail, 3% for HIV negative fell into this category, but 11% for HIV positive. So this gives us kind of a perspective. And our population, we, with a lot of our population being what we classify as long-term survivors, therefore living with HIV for 25 plus years, we are seeing long lasting effects of old medication and previously untreated HIV infections. This has a result in our population living with what we call comorbidities, which are coexisting health concerns. And to do, due to the num uh, number of high, high number of comorbidities people living with HIV have, we've actually seen an adoption towards using the word multimorbidity in the literature. Um, you may have seen in my bio, if you were able to read our bios before the presentation, that I helped co-create uh, co and found the Canada's first HIV-specific exercise program in a hospital setting. And on average, the participants had five comorbidities each. So these com comorbidities affect all domains of health, which included physiological, psychosocial, and psychological health domains. 
So this is bringing me to the point of why interdisciplinary care for people living with HIV is critical for supporting positive health outcomes. So how I'm going to explain this is the important um, using my exercise program as an example. So the program was run by myself, a registered nurse who was able to support the clients via medical lens to ensure stability and safety while participating in physical activity and exercise. We had a physiotherapist co-facilitating with me, uh, which allowed the clients to be supported via functional health lens. So being able to take stairs, going walking and helping to complete activities of daily living. In addition, I brought on allied health colleagues through self-management presentations and discussions to talk about their various topics of their expertise. This included mental health clinicians, massage therapists, co-RNs, recreational therapists, as well as social workers and a pharmacist. So this allowed the clients to be introduced to various treatment philosophies and approaches which could help manage their health complexities. So this is why it's important for our um, individuals that we're taking care of, physicians and caregivers ourselves to collaborate with a broad range of professionals. It, it, and this is essential because it addresses the complex needs of each individual fully. We're addressing our, the individuals as a whole in person and their whole health experience. So moving on to how we can make sure our clients feel comfortable and safe in our care. So confidentiality is key. So unfortunately, stigma still runs rampant throughout our communities when it comes to HIV and sexual orientations. So being aware of the language we use and being aware of any possible passive disclosure of patient health information is extremely important. So an example is a voicemail. So if I left a voicemail for someone stating, hi, I'm Ryan Wanamaker, the RN from Casey House, and someone else listened to that voicemail, they could easily figure out I am calling from an HIV specific facility and question the HIV status of that individual. Therefore, simply changing my practice to saying, hi, I'm Ryan Winemaker, the community registered nurse, is an effective way of maintaining confidentiality and avoiding these issues. So we can implement these strategies throughout all our care and throughout a day-to-day -day practice and to make sure we avoid these issues. So things like badges, lanyards, identification should not be displayed until we actually personally show the client or the individual we're providing care to. So this is extremely important um, when it comes to providing any form of treatment in home care settings, consulting in acute hospital settings, and long-term care. I always like to think of you never know who can see you and you can never know who can hear you. So stigma can be very different, um, but, but very similar depending on the cultural groups our clients belong to. So it's important for us to understand and know how your clients identify and who they feel comfortable around is uh, to make sure that we're providing client-centered care. An example of this is understanding your local community resources. So for an example is through for HIV care, knowing your local ASOs, which stands for AIDS Service Organizations, and understanding their variety and who their target populations are. So here in Toronto, of course, being a major city, we have a variety of places where we can connect people so they can feel supported when it back in the back going back going back into the community um, from hospital or just because connecting, uh, they want to have more connection within home care services. So for example, in ASOs in Toronto, we have the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention. We have Asian Community AIDS Services and we have Toronto People with AIDS Foundation. These organizations will have peer support workers that fully and truly undershare, understand and share the same cultural experience as our clients. They can provide one-on-one -on -one support, group programming and various other services. And the last point I want to talk about is knowing how to be a good 2S LGBTQ plus ally. Our clients do not access services because they don't feel like they are accepted or understood by providers. 
for example, within my exercise program, we had a lot of individuals not participating in physical activity because they didn't feel comfortable in your regular gym setting or community center because they felt like the staff didn't understand them as a member of the 2S LGBTQ plus community as well as their HIV status. So a way you can help fix this issue is leading organizations like the 519 have created programs and tools that you can access for free and help educate yourself and, and your organization. So I just want to mention a couple of the resources quickly before I finish off um, for today. And it, the first one is LGBTQ 2S Inclusion Playbook. It, this is free on the 519 website. And it provides medical professionals, care providers, administrative teams, and policymakers with tools, resources, and guidelines to better understand and meet the needs of LGBTQ2S people in healthcare settings, as well as social service care settings. And if you are a caregiver at home and not working in a clinical setting, one of the first steps you can take is by starting to do a search for uh, resources to be an effective trans ally, to be an effective ally in general. And you can do this by looking at the 519 website. You can use organizations like Rainbow Health Ontario, even Googling qualities of an ally. There's another service called PFLA Canada, which is very helpful to providing one-on-one -on -one support as well as um, the Ontario Caregivers Organization has a great um, list of resources on their website for this community, which I reviewed and I thought it was an absolutely great um, collection. So that, that's basically the resources I wanted to quickly share right now. And these are very surface level items, but very important to understand their complexities and significance for the community, especially people living with HIV. And that is, I'm going to finish off there and hopefully there's some questions I can answer later, but um, I hope you guys learned something new today. Thank you, Ryan. That was great. Actually, it is uh, this week, actually it's 40 years since HIV uh, came about. So we are still making great advancements in medical care and treatment for HIV. And last week was the AIDS vigil. So thank you, Ryan. So I'm going to go to our next panelist right now, Shoshana. So Shoshana uh, will be speaking in terms of trans uh, caregiving and services. Hi folks, I uh, hope you all can hear me. Devin, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, it's a little complicated. I'm actually 74 years old and I started transitioning when I, when I was 58 years old as part of my journey. I came into this part of my journey having no idea what it is to be trans, the complications, etc. And I had so many stereotypes in my mind. One of the things I had to deal with basically is my family. And that touches on family of choice or chosen family. I have kids, I have grandkids and I have great grandkids and my parents were still alive when I started transitioning. The level of acceptance and respect is zero to 100%. And I know that. And I was happy with that and I accepted that and I embraced it. Going forward in my life, I don't really have a family of choice anymore because of my age and people I know they are like, it's complicated. But I have friends and people I trust and people I have belief in that they'll be there for me going forward. As I said before, it's complicated. It's not easy. But for me, it's worth it's worth the cost, and it's worth the it's worth what I'm going through now. Being being 74 years old and transitioning at 58 created new health issues for me. Going to a doctor, going to a healthcare provider, and having to basically talk about my name. Or, ask, or being asked questions I find problematic. It's, it's painful sometimes. 
So I go to a doctor and I have to fill in the form and everybody does that. When you go to a new doctor or a new dentist or a new eye, eye optometrist, you have to fill in the form. And you have to write down the meds. So if I have meds, I have to write it down. The problem is, like, like Ryan said, confidentiality. I don't want the secretary or the, or the nurse to see the details. I don't think they need to know. And I will tell the doctor, I will tell the optometrist, I will tell the dentist what they need to know to take care of me. And that's it. But that's my choice. I use the I word. I'm talking about my experience as a tra as an older trans person. It's my experience. So when I go to a doctor or I go to a healthcare provider and it's going to happen, I want to know that there's respect there. You know, we talk about cultural competencies and uh, clinical competencies. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I grew up as an engineer. I, my, I have no idea what all the competencies are. All I know is that when, someone, when I walk into the office or I walk, talk to somebody who's taking care of me, I know that there has to be, and I demand respect. I want to be respected for all of who I am. And I'm hoping that the person has actually done their homework about what it is to be a member of the 2S LGBTQ community, and in particular, what is a trans person? Like, what do we go through? What are our life experiences? The suicide, attempted suicide rate in the trans community is 40%. And, and it's mind boggling. And a lot of it has to do with support. You know, if I go to a healthcare provider, I want to smile. I don't want to be hugged. I don't want to hug. I want to be respected. I want to smile. I want to have a, co a good conversation about what's happening with me in general, not just about the hormones, if I'm taking or not taking. I want a conversation, a general conversation. Like it's, being trans is part of who I am. I'm much more complicated than that. Everybody's much more complicated than being a nurse or a doctor or a healthcare provider. It's much, life is much more complicated than that. So that has to be part of the conversation. Going through medical school, like I'm, as an activist, I've done my homework. I've done some investing. I've done. I've spoken, and I know what. Go, what I know issue of implicit biases that exist. I know the issue of lack of knowledge or sensitivity, and it's out. You know, like it's. There's a need. To educate to people to be educated, to educate themselves, to have that desire to learn, to know, to be educated, to be sensitive. It's so important to use the right language. If you don't know my pronoun, don't say Mr. or, or Sir. Say, you know, like if you don't know my name, if you know my name, you don't know what pronoun I use, say, Shoshana, what's happening with you today? And when you talk to your colleague, Shoshana said this, Shoshana did this. Don't say she or, or him or her or they, because you don't know. I actually use she and her. But if you're not sure because of my voice, then just say, Shoshana, what's happening with you? Or you talk to someone else, say, oh, Shoshana isn't feeling well today. What do you think? Don't say, don't, because you don't know. On the phone, I get misgendered. I can't correct everybody. It's, it's ridiculous. So I don't. And then, I used to make an issue of it, but you know what? It's not worth it's not worth my aggravation. It's not worth me getting st stressed out and angry when the person just doesn't know. If it's face to face, it's a whole different story. If it's over on the phone or whatever, I'm I'm not okay with it. I let her go. I let her roll on, right? Documents. I want to see documents that say you know, give me an option, and it's happening, but. I have to fight for that. I have to demand that kind of stuff. It, there has to be a certain amount of, like, see the trees in the forest, open up your mind, see what's happening around you, right? With regards to surgery and hormones, in Ontario, it's a choice. I'm on hormones. I've been on hormones since 2005. My choice 
and there's body changes. But not all the changes you can see, and some you can see. I want people to actually understand that there's a possibility that myself or anybody else is trans is may or may not be on hormones, may or may not have surgery. Because someone wants to give me a bath, they're going to freak out. They're going to see the breasts and they're going to see whatever they see down there. And if they're not open-minded, I'm going to kick them out of, out of the house. They're not going to stick around. If I get a look that says, what? That's it. End of the story. They're not, they're gone. They're gone. So things are happening. Going forward, there's a lot happening out there, a lot of great things happening. But do your homework. Do your homework, you know, culturally wise, clinically wise, the information's out there. The stuff's out there. Realize there's a possibility you'll have a trans person, right? Or a person who's, whatever that means being trans, because for me, trans is one thing. For someone else, it may mean something else. Another trans. I'm under the umbrella, but as I talk now about my journey. I want to be respected, even when I'm on, or even when I have dementia. Oh God, my God, my parents both died from dementia. Both my parents. So I don't know how many of you have actually have experience with people with dementia. I, I assume that majority of you have. Imagine someone with dementia, that someone trans who started transitioning later in life, right? What goes first? The memory, the, the latest memories go first. Uh, people start forgetting that they transitioned. That, I, this person I know probably passed away years ago. This person, suddenly the person was like, uh, male or female, like what name are you using, right? But it comes to a point, like my, with my mother, no memory, like everything's gone. How do, you re how do you, as a service provider, relate to us? Will there still be respect? The onus falls onto the healthcare provider or onto the healthcare, onto the caregiver. The onus of responsibility and respect falls on the people who are dealing with us. And that's all I can say. So realize that with dementia, it's the elephant, big elephant in the room. And thank you for listening. And for being here. Thank you, Shoshana. So some of the things I want to mention that is really important for those of you who are providing healthcare, just make sure your intake forms are inclusive. Actually, you give clients the option to self-identify. If you just have male and female, that's a problem. You need to make sure you have male, female, trans, and self-identify us. And I'm happy to help anybody who needs that help. Also in terms of when you're meeting a patient for the first time, do not assume automatically you know their gender expression or identity. Because a lot of times the information is not given to workers when they're going to someone's home. When you get to the patient's home, ask them and introduce yourself. My name is Jane. My pronoun is she and her. What's your pronoun? Always that ha have that as a basic conversation before you assume someone's gender based on how they dress or the voice, sound of the voice, because we don't know a lot of things about people, right? And that's how we build therapeutic relationships with clients once we're going to offer long-term care. And if you do make a mistake, because that will happen, do one simple apology. I apologize, what's your pronoun? And keep it at that. Do not go into a whole you know, discussion that my best friend is trans and I go to the Pride March and no one cares. <laughs> they just want to receive the care at that point. So just keep it short and simple. And anyone who needs further resources, uh, feel free to look up the resources at OCO. Okay. So I'm going to go to our third speaker, Susa. Go ahead, Susa. Hey, all. Thank you so much. And I really want to put out a thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me. And I wanted to say happy pride to all of you. Thank you so much to Ryan and Shoshana and David. I'm going to be repeating some of the things you just mentioned. So before I begin, I just wanted to situate myself, tell you who I am, um, that I am a white, I am cisgender, so I'm not trans identified. I am cisgender. I'm a white European settler. Uh, my background, my people originate from Croatia. Uh, we had a beautiful, um, uh, Katie did a beautiful introduction um, around landing acknowledgement, but just wanting, I'd like to do that to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories 
uh, at the in Toronto of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. A little bit more about me. I am a self-identified queer person. I am some might, might say lesbian. It's not really a term I use. I use dyke more often, uh, which may seem like a derogatory term uh, to some, but to me it is not, as I see it as more meaning a politic, a left-leaning mindset. Um, and so folks in my life uh, who know me can call me a dyke. Uh, and I'm also maybe also uh, more feminine presenting. So I call myself a lipstick dyke. Uh, so that tells you a little bit more about me. Um, I also come to you with different hats on. So I come to you as a primary health care provider uh, to uh, patients and I work in a large family health team and I provide care. My, about 90% of my practice is to trans and non-binary patients. Uh, I also have provided care to chosen family members, uh, more so in the context of providing end of life care. I also uh, come to you as a previous volunteer from the AIDS Committee of Toronto and Trinity Home Hospice. And that was a long time ago, over 25 years ago. And lastly, and, and I think really importantly and very timely is I come to you as a queer widow of nine years. Yesterday was my nine year um, widow, widow anniversary. So um, the my time here is short, but I did want to talk to you a little bit um, around some maybe some do's and don'ts. Uh, to SLGBTQ provision. So I'm not the expert, uh, but I, and I'm not coming to you from a prescriptive place, like telling you, you must do this. But really, this is a compilation of some of the mistakes I have made and that I continue to make. So I'm coming to you from a space of humility and that acknowledging I'm a work in progress and that we're all here to do our best. And uh, if we, as long as we come to, to this with that energetic, I think we can't go can't go wrong. So one of my dues is I want to create a safe honoring space for our clients, our patients to enter. And so remember, you're entering people's most sacred spaces, some of you, in that you're going into their homes. Um, so you're entering their physical space and home is really the crux of, of a, the safest space where people I think all people need to be able to express their individuality, express their queerness, their, their gender expression identities openly. They should not never be judged for that. And you're also entering a person's potentially their physical space, like their body through potentially touching or engaging with their physical body. So these are all sacred spaces. Um, there is literature. So Shoshana, you kind of touched on this, but there is some great literature that I, I did a lit review a few years ago, looking at trans and non-binary people who, who uh, were approaching end of life and uh, many of them felt, uh, who did not have dementia, um, but who felt they needed to detransition. So needed to unfortunately transition from their authentic gender back to their gender assigned at birth uh, so that they felt safe receiving care in their home or in an institution, which is incredibly sad to, my, to me that they didn't feel safe. So clearly we need to advocate all of us for systemic change. Um, David touched on this as well. So uh, uh, practicing, practice this with people in your home. I practice this with everybody and I'm getting better. Practice it with the cat and the dog. Um, what is your authentic name and program, pro, pronoun? Sorry. So this is the first impression that we make to people. And it's like that we want them to feel safe with us and trust them with our your, their care. So one way I do it is I say, hi, my name is Sue Souza. I'm, I'm your, you know, I'm a primary healthcare nurse practitioner. My pronouns today are she and her. And if that changes, I'll tell you what pronouns work for you today. Please tell me if that changes. So why the change is important is honoring the mutability potentially of our uh, gender, gender identity, gender expression. There can also be mutability in sexual orientation. And, and so honoring that and creating that space. What's important is whatever the person, the client tells you is document that in their file. So if you're, um, so that everybody knows that this person's authentic name is this, it might be different than the name on their health card and the pronouns they go by are this. So very important. And then if we're referring to people to other services in our referral notes, we should be trying to do this. I'm practicing this. Um, also, we're often meeting clients at times in their life where they feel a lack of control because they might have physical, emotional, mental health, spiritual issues that are, are being challenged. So people are often in, in a place where their sense of control over themselves is diminished. And so providing choice is critically important. For example, like ask permission if you want to move items in a patient's home. 
And you always ask permission, like, first of all, is it okay if I come into your home? And then is it okay if I sit with you? Is it okay if I touch you? Um, even I would have done this in the past with working with folks in comas. Like I may not ask permission, but I would be talking to them. Like, this is what I'm going to do because those folks, though they appear to not be here, they are certainly here. And the sense of hearing is the last to go. So wanting to really honor a person's physicality because we mm -hmm. all deserve to feel physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, safety and control, particularly in a time of, of maybe illness. That's when we're the most feeling vulnerable. I know myself, I'm a terrible patient. So honoring, honoring that. Um, and something I'm practicing, I'm a pretty verbal person. Um, I'm practicing being quiet and trying to hear a person's verbal and nonverbal communication. So mm -hmm. when I say that, like note the difference between the act of listening which is just the passive act of listening versus the act of really hearing you, hearing the other person. So um, that's where that meditative space of like quieting oneself and trying to really hear the person. And sometimes in language, I redirect that. What I heard you say is this. Um, so uh, often checking in, this is what I heard you say. Is that what you said? Um, think about what you're presenting in your physicality. Again, with masks, you know, we have eyes left, right? I'm often behind masks and shields. So trying to, in many cultures, it's acceptable to have direct eye contact. I do that. Um, so direct eye contact, a soft gaze, a smile, which you may not see, you see it today, indicating that you're safe with me um, and um, follow the person's cue. So if let's say the person does not want direct eye contact, uh, then, then I, I would avoid eye contact based on what the cues that that person is giving me. Also coming with, think about where your mind is at, what you're thinking, come with a curious, from a curious mindset, looking at really asking open-ended questions without judgment. So things, another thing I think that's a do is watch and listen for cues related to that person's, your client's language or the language a person uses. For example, I use the term dyke to introduce myself. So you can ask me if you can, is it okay if you, I introduce you to other people that way, what would you want me to do? And what I do when I'm interviewing a patient or with a patient or client is I mirror their language. So the way they're speaking, I ask that. And if I need to want to use other types of language, um, I ask permission. So sometimes permission to use like more common language, like if I'm doing a sexual health history. So instead of saying intercourse, I might use a different language, right? You could imagine more, more street language, but I always ask permission for that. Also being careful about using men medical language, like the person is not dementia, the person is a person first, and also they may not know what that means. And so take their lead as to how they describe their health condition and follow those language cues. Other do's, do's. David mentioned this, I would love to see more systemic changes. Can we have gender neutral bathrooms and in institutions? We should. Do we have images on our walls that indicate this is a safe place for you to be here, that they're images of it to us LGBTQ plus folks? Um, our, our in gender diverse, gender inclusive intake forms. For example, the San Francisco Center for Excellence in Trans Care has an excellent one that asks like, what is your current gender identity? And they give lots of options. It's not like M, F and other. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be other. Like that doesn't sound very good. So it meaning like none of us wanna be othered. We wanna be accepted. Another do. Let's try to create more, more LG, 2S LGBTQ uh, environments through our language and specifically with trans and non-binary folks uh, misgendering people. So it's not if it's gonna happen, it's when it happens because it will, and David touched on this, apologize, correct, move on. Look at your language. So instead of mother or father, how about parent? Instead of husband, wife, you could say partner. Um, and assume, avoid things like that. You assume everyone is heterosexual, that everyone who is male identifies is attracted to female people, that someone who is a trans feminine person is attracted to male people, not necessarily male identified folks, not necessarily true. And so, and understanding that there are many genders and it's not just the M and F that there are a constellation of genders in the world and that there can be mutability 
in that gender expression and how I express myself. We all express ourselves. Uh, there can be mutability and movement in our lives, definitely. Look at terms that you use with people. I often take people's um, uh, guidance around what language to use. So sometimes I start with language if I'm, let's say, working in a genital area of a person, <laughs> I always ask permission, but also things like I may not say, um, I might use language like front hole, back hole. Uh, also, I tend to err on the side if someone was a trans masculine person, so someone who was maybe assigned female at birth and identified more along the masculine spectrum, even if that person was never on hormones and never had top surgery to remove their, their tissue here, I refer to their, that part of their body as their chest, not as their breast area. So honoring the gender identity that that person is and how you would refer to parts of their body, definitely sensitivity around genital area. Also looking at your assumptions, we all make assumptions, but understanding that I am only one, one lipstick dyke talking to you. I'm not all. So I, we don't get every two SLGBTQ person does not get the other others. We are not homogenous. We're not all the same sort of the saying like, well, my brother's gay. So I understand all gay men is ridiculous, obviously, right? That we're all different and watch assumptions about who is defined as family. So many two SLGBTQ folks like myself, we have chosen to be estranged from our families of origin <clears throat> and we've created new families or villages with deep enriching relationships. And some folks that I work with in my practice don't have any family or chosen family, and some do. So, and how I frame it is that people, anyone who was in my life has definitely earned that spot. So in closing, I come to you as a queer healthcare provider, a caregiver. I feel that we as queer folks, we bring a unique perspective of living out loud, proud, and authentic lives, definitely. And I feel that our authenticity in the face of uh, many systemic agency and individual oppressions that exist empowers uh, us to understand the person we were, we we're caring for, who is also 2SLGBTQ, to be in their authenticity. And I think that we as 2SLGBTQ people, we're less afraid of questioning the, the status quo. And just by living, we question that status quo. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. That was amazing. That was incredible from all three of you. I just also want to touch and explain a bit further because we've used the word chosen families a lot. And Sue, you explained that, but also just to give it a context. So because as Sue mentioned, a lot of us don't have the best relationships with our family, with our biological families, and many of us have estranged relationships. So a chosen family is a group of people whom you are emotionally close and consider family, even though you're not biologically or legally related to. This can also, uh, you can also use chosen families of next of kin, substitute decision maker and substitute decision, uh, person to make decisions. So if you're in a situation where someone doesn't have the same last name, it's still okay and legal to allow the person to help you make decisions. For example, we talked about dementia and trans individuals. So a trans individual with dementia, depending on the stage, may decide to have a different gender expression on a different day. And if you're not sure what pronoun to use, you just ask the, the next of kin, what should I do today? How should I dress them for the day? And that's just part of getting to know the client in terms of client-centered care. So um, we will take some questions also from the audience. If uh, folks have questions, I'm looking in the chat um, room. Um, let's see, I have one question here. So um, one of the things, uh, Ryan, this is for you. So, what do caregivers need to do once a patient is discharged from the healthcare center, example, Casey House? So what are some of the at-home care that someone needs to be aware of? Yeah, for sure. So when I originally saw this question and heard this question, I took a step back actually. And I just wanted to bring us there for a moment because working with outpatients and often part of my role was to help individuals get admitted into Casey House and then I would work with them after they were admitted. And these questions I kind of developed throughout my time at Casey House. And I think it's really important for all of us who are caregivers to ask these to ensure that we have a safe and a smooth transition back into the community and are able to provide care at home. So I'm just gonna read them off to you quickly. And these are questions I always reflect on. So Think that you're at the stage that prior to the person being discharged from a hospital. And I want you to think, is that patient or loved one 
wanting or able or are they connected to any appropriate 2S LGBTQ plus resources and services? That's the first question. The second question, which is extremely important is, will that individual be safe going back where they're going? So I'm happy Sue mentioned this and actually all our panelists have mentioned this is that many geriatric patients or older adults who are going back or being transferred to a retirement home feel like they have to go back in the closet to feel safe because that's not a, a queer friendly, and I use the word queer as an umbrella term, but it's a queer friendly um, environment to go back into or they don't feel the sense of acceptance. Uh, have you spoken to that individual to see what they want or need? That individual may not want to be connected to services. They may want to be connected to services. It's an individual experience. It's a unique experience. And even though we all may be part of this community, we want to make sure that we also give that autonomy. Um, will that individual be able to express their sexuality in a healthy and safe way where they're going? So just a reminder, sexual health does not go away when someone requires care and does not go away when someone ages. So sexual health is extremely important and we should try to foster and embrace that with no matter who, how old you are, your age or where you're gonna be living. And then the last question I always think about is, and these are facts I always really want to express is that we should always be looking for LGBTQ plus uh, affirming services. So again, many older adult, adults and their care providers are reluctant to look and access other services because of discrimination. So there's this one quick thing I would like to mention, you can Google, it's called 10 tips for finding LGBT affirming services. And it, this is a US resource and I found it recently, but it is a two page PDF that I do find that it could be help with guidance and like almost like a checklist as a reminder to take those steps. Look, you won't be using the same exact services because they're not here in Ontario, but remind yourself, hey, maybe we should check into this, ask the person. So that's just what I would like to say about that question. Thank you, Ryan. I'll take one question here from Kim. Um, it's a question on, and I'll read this to the panelists. In my healthcare role, it is important that we know a person's pregnancy status. I'm in a position to educate our staff to do, the, to do this respectfully for all the team. We often ask female patients of childbearing age if there's any chance of pregnancy. How can we change our practice to be inclusive so we just ask every patient regardless of how they present? If there's any chance of pregnancy, we are rewriting our policy to ask patients with female reproductive or what are your thoughts on these? Uh, the, it's Sue, uh, the Ontario midwives have a really good uh, document. Um, I, literally, I would Google, I have, I can provide the link. I'd have to look through other slide sets, but they have a gender identity policy in place, which is excellent, which I think every agency should have uh, related to inclusive inclusion based on the human rights code uh, for, for that, but, but also related to language. Uh, so for the parent, uh, for the person carrying the pregnancy, um, for people who are chest feeding, see language and I agree it is it is difficult uh, we have challenges at my hospital as well like with the breast center trying to change that name to something else where people it might be that we're doing chest screening right so not breast screening so I, I agree that language is difficult but they, I would really refer you to the Ontario midwife site and there is a uh, excellent document that they have on their website I'll try to find that for you and Katie is here with some questions Yes, thank you, Devin. So we are getting a lot of action in our chat box, a lot of really positive comments. Thank you. I'm taking copious notes. So I'm gonna to try to hit some of the key questions um, in our remaining few minutes um, to try to get to everything all at once. So thanks for covering the, the pregnancy question, Devin. Um, for Shoshana, uh, an earlier question, someone asked, I'm a professional librarian who often have requests for medical information. Have you had experiences using libraries and may you discuss what respectful language you would um, value in those spaces? With regards to libraries, <clears throat> I find mm -hmm. the libraries is a really good resource actually for, with a computer, it's actually a good resource for finding stuff. Mm -hmm. I did that 
to find out that I was a gender outlaw, I actually had, went, on a, went to the library and on a computer in 2005 and I, and I actually answered the questions twice. First time I cheated, the second time I, I, I cheated. I said, you know what, she's trying to do it again. Honestly, came out as a gender outlaw and that was basically the first real step where I said, you know what, find yourself a therapist. So I went to, to Sherman Health Clinic, right? Uh, libraries are good, uh, good uh, libraries in general are a good place to find material, fiction and nonfiction on uh, on trans stuff or like it, on general to us LGBTQ stuff. Like I'm reading stuff on so supposedly lesbian romance and there's a non-binary person carried in the, in the book and it's like, wow, that's amazing. Or a trans person in the book and it's like, it comes to, it's supposed to be a lesbian story, right? That's how the library classifies it, lesbian romance, lesbian fiction. And they've got other people in there from the communities, right? And it's like, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I answered the question. Yeah, well, and I think it just raises another point that we're kind of touching on the medical profession, but we encounter people everywhere in the community. And so this is a community conversation, not just necessarily a medical conversation, right? So I think yeah. that it's great to bring that forward. Um, from someone from a different uh, service provider perspective. So thank you, Shoshana. Um, Sue, we did have a question from the audience about you had indicated in your introductory um, speech, I guess, that you did some literature review. And I don't know if that was more informal or formal, but folks were asking if there was somewhere that they could find that information, if it was published or was it your own sort of investigation there? It was, it was my own investigation. I did do a talk. Uh, this was now a number of probably four or five years ago now as like an opening speak at a palliative care conference. I can see if I can find that slide set that refers to that. Um, I'll see if I can find it. That would be great if you have those resources. And for the folks on the call today, we were actively sharing information in the chat box but we'll also be sending out resources in the email post webinar along with the recording as well. So we can really ensure everyone has as much research and information and, and um, content that we can all gain and learn from. So thanks Sue. Um, this question is for Ryan. It, they say, I am a life enrichment worker in long-term care. Are there specific exercises or functional movements that suffer more in an HIV plus community as they age you mentioned stairs. Is this a goal or the movement to a larger goal? What are your most beneficial movements to strengthen or maintain? Oh, good question. This is kind of my, my love interest in my job is uh, physical activity and exercise. So stairs, walking, um, your activities of daily living are usually, I would refer to those as the goals. So I'm gonna use an example I had I had an individual that wasn't able to open the subway doors. So as they were coming into our program, we did we worked in exercises. So I think the key um, to strengthen them and to so that they could be able to open those doors into the subway. I think the key is to take it back and look at working on different exercises or physical activities. So we have to remember. Exercise is a subset of physical activity. Exercise is a organized goal-driven activity where physical activity can be anything but going to enjoy a walk in the park or playing badminton or anything like that. Um, so I would recommend that you look at the specific individual and their specific needs. Uh, is it muscle strengthening? Is it working on aerobic strengthening? Do they have cardiovascular issues? So heart issues that causes them to not be able to do a lot of cardio. Um, look at all those diverse things for that client picture and try to make an individualized plan. Um, in our, I'm happy to share more about the exercise program at a later time, but we often did a variety. We would do more aerobic type of exercise and then we would do a strength type of exercise. And the one tool that's really accessible for um, healthcare centers to use is a TheraBand, which is the stretchy mm -hmm. resistant bands. They're easy, they're lightweight, so individuals can carry them around. They're appropriate for home use and they're not, and they're 
more affordable because you get a whole roll and you can able to divvy it up as needed. And there's mm -hmm. different strengths for those TheraBands. And we saw some very amazing results. And often when you engage in this type of physical, physical activity and exercise, those individuals will see benefits that they weren't expecting. So, and that's a really key part. So just bring it back, look at the individual themselves, look at their specific goals and then work to, if it's stairs, let's work on strengthening those legs, strengthening the core, strengthening on their stanima, and then eventually work on those stairs. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one final question. It's a big one. Um, and maybe Devin, if you're okay with starting us off on this, I think that would be great. The question is, what are the challenges faced when giving care to the 2SLGBTQ plus community? So big question for a few minutes remaining. And I don't know, Devin, if you're comfortable starting us off and maybe hitting some key highlights there. So um, I've done a gazillion trainings, long-term care homes, so to speak. And I've, I was probably if they're bored of, um, the registered, I can't remember the exact acronym, but the board that actually oversees the long-term care homes in, in, in the GTA area, I think they oversee 600 homes. So the typical uh, challenge is people don't believe, and this is something I encountered, that people don't believe that if, as you age, you still are LGBTQ. Yeah. That they assume that the moment you become senior, your orientation disappears. So I say, no, it's like telling someone you're no longer heterosexual when you turn 65. So first to believe and to know and to understand that actually sexual orientation is a lifelong cause, right? So also what I've come to understand is many uh, staff who go to homes to provide care, go to somebody's apartment or residence or public or private, they don't know anything about the person's identity except the health problem. Right. And so, because none of the information is given to the person in the checklist. So you have to get to know the patient and because many seniors, it's a criminal offense in Canada to be LGBTQ. It's only 52 years ago we decriminalized LGBTQ. So many of those folks whom you're providing care to are in the closet, don't want to say anything, they don't know how you're gonna treat them, and no one wants to be an activist at 75 years of age. So just get to know who the patient is, ask the right pronouns, ask the in inclusive language, let me get to know you, this is who I am. You know, I provide services also to all clients of all races, diversity, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender. Just put that simple statement, it's an opening line. And then let the person disclose whatever they feel comfortable as they get to know you. So I'll stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Thank you, Devin. I'm, we are just getting to our one o'clock mark, but I wanna give Sue and Ryan and Shoshana an opportunity to maybe quickly respond to that question before I wrap up. So as if you choose to, you don't have to, um, but as uh, Shoshana is saying, no. <laughs> so um, the question again is what are those challenges faced when giving care to the two SLGBTQ plus community? Big question. Sue? It's so big. <laughs> I would definitely everything that David said, and I love your line, David, so I'm going to steal it. Uh, but I definitely do the, the, my, my pronouns. That's, that's one of my lines I use because I'm working with gender diverse folk. Um, I, I think I would like to advocate that we can advocate uh, for systemic change, that we have anti-oppressive um, policies, but they're not just on paper, but they're actually enacted. How do we move stuff from paper to action? Um, and I have challenges with my own institution doing that, like where it's, oh, so frustrating. And, and so that's what I would want. The world is better for 2SLGBTQ folk today than it was 52, 52 years ago, I think you said, David. But we have a ways to go, right? And in healthcare, in particular, where we're, we have the huge privilege and honor of entering people's safe spaces, that being their homes, their, their rooms in their institutions, or their physical bodies, you know, touching them. This is where we have to make sure that, the, that we don't just have a rainbow flag up. Um, the progress flag up. That's awesome to have the progress flag up. It's not enough. It's a beginning start of a conversation but then how do we enact it mm -hmm. that's great thank you go ahead Brian. oh yeah i'll keep it real quick because i know we're just at one o'clock but i am so happy to hear this almost exact same response as i was going to say the thing i'll add is just to be continue to be mindful of any microaggressions you have towards the community 
your own biases. You may believe we're, you're a great ally, which is fantastic, but make sure to actually be a good ally, but doing some research and representation is key of all diversity. And we want to make sure that we're representing within the workspace, but also within the members of your team. It's extremely important to make people feel comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. I may be a member of the community, but my experience is my own and very unique. And we have to remember that being a part of the 2S LGBTQ plus community mm -hmm. is a cult late, well, I've referred to as a culturally layered experience because we have, you're a part of this cultural community that's become a culture due to the marginalization we've had in the past and today, but you also have aspects to individual culture due to your ethnicity, your religion, your race. And we have to remember that it becomes a layered aspect and all our perspectives are going to be different. So always treat that person as an individual and treat them like you would want to be treated. And that's my biggest, biggest point there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. A great point to leave this on. Um, so we are just a little over one o'clock. So I do want to say thank you to Devin and Sue, Ryan, Shoshana for joining us today. I have taken so many notes. We have tons of resources in the chat. This is clearly just the beginning of a really important and much bigger conversation. Um, so hopefully this can continue either within ourselves, within our communities, in our, our professions, wherever we find ourselves. Mm -hmm.